I'm Jim Haskell, editor of the Bridgewater Daily Observations, and I want to welcome you to our latest installment of our Editor's Pick series, where we highlight what we think are the most important daily observations from the last month. Although given Russia's invasion of Ukraine, I could have said just the last week. Joining me today are Bridgewater's Chief Administrative Officer, Richard Falkenrath, Co-CIO for Sustainability, Karen Carniol tambor and Senior Investor, Larry Kofsky. Our discussion will start with Richard for a short assessment of how he's seen the crisis so far. And as a reminder to our listeners, Richard has vast experience in the national security realm, having served as deputy assistant to the president in the George W. Bush administration from 2000 to 2004, and as deputy commissioner for counterterrorism of the New York City Police Department from 2006 to 2010. And he has served in various positions in academia and think tanks at Harvard's Kennedy School, the Brookings Institution, and the Council on Foreign Relations. When we're done with Richard, we'll turn to Karen for a discussion on the impact of the war on commodity markets and the broader inflationary impacts on the macro environment. And then we'll turn to Larry on how we're processing this exogenous risk. We hope you enjoy the conversation. Richard, it's almost a given that when we have you on, something is not quite right in the world. For the past couple of years, it was COVID-19, and you are a go-to person, and now it's Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Uh, Policymakers and investors alike are in the midst of reassessing risk, and events are moving very quickly. So let me start with this. You know, you've lived through a number of crises in your career, particularly in your time as a national security official. So in times of crisis, how do you make sense of the reams of information coming at you all at once? Well, Jim, there was a rule that I learned in the White House Situation Room, which was first reports are almost always wrong, which was a a way to consolidate lots of uncertainty that comes into all the information coming at you. There's just incorrect information. There's information moving too fast for you to keep track of. There's deliberate misinformation that people are planting, and there's misperceptions where you're incorrectly interpreting what is an accurate situation. And I think that's happening in this case, where we are at some level overwhelmed with the amount of information that we are getting out of the Ukrainian crisis, but also have a complete absence of the real insight that is needed to understand it, which is what is going on in Vladimir Putin's mind and in the small council of hardened advisors that he has around him. And for that, I'd say anyone on the outside of the U.S. intelligence community who claims to have an answer to that is deluding themselves. At some level, we just don't know what he's going to move do next. So with that caveat, um, you know, we're taping this on the late afternoon of March 1st. And so if you could just synthesize for us where you think the situation right now stands. Well, the initial phase of the military offensive against Ukraine d- did not go as planned. It clearly was based on political assumptions about the Ukrainian resistance that were incorrect. And the Russian government is now adapting to that changing circumstance by escalating massively and reverting to their normal strategy and doctrine of combined arms assault, which are much larger and frankly, far, far more destructive to the civilian population in the place that's being attacked. The international community has partially solidified or in opposition to this and offered sanctions. Everyone knows about the sanctions, but sanctions that are truly unprecedented. The Western Europeans and the United States are really in lockstep, which was not always the case in dealing with crises in the past. The rest of the world, the Middle East, Asia, is a little more uncertain, but the unanimity between the United States and the Western European countries is extraordinary and critically important for the crisis. When you look at the reaction by the U.S. administration and allied governments, I'm wondering, you know, as a former national security official, do you see principles at work? And if so, what are they in terms of how they're managing this crisis? I do, Jim. Number one is no military response. So we are at this time not contemplating war against Russia over an independent Ukraine. Two is achieve as much political unanimity as possible in the international community. And that has been effectively done with the Western European countries to a remarkable degree. Three, impose as much economic pain as possible on the Russian government. It really unprecedented levels of economic retaliation against Russia with a few limitations so far, but really something that we've never seen before. And four, try to consider ways to de-escalate the crisis through talks, which don't seem to be going anywhere, 
But we know that there are diplomatic attempts to find a way to slow the pace of hostilities and hopefully get to some sort of ceasefire, uh, which will slow the escalation of this war into other domains. The uh, the international responses, as you mentioned, you know, the economic sanctions have been described as completely unprecedented. And so I'd like you to, if you would, just talk about that a little bit. Why is that? How did it come about? Is it sustainable uh, for a period of time, in your view? You know, historically, the United States and the Western European countries really did not agree on sanctions very often. They were often at loggerheads. In fact, the European Union occasionally took action to neutralize United States sanctions on governments that we did not agree with. And so in this case, they've really come together in ways that are truly unprecedented. We've never seen this degree of, of action against such an important state as we have today. Secondly, the speed with which these changes were rolled out is amazing. I mean, these are really complex things that normally develop over weeks and months when they do happen. And in this case, a sanctions regime was developed and implemented in just a few days. And the most international observers and government officials that I know who've been in that space have never seen anything like that before. The implication of that is the full second and third order effects of all these sanctions are not yet understood. And we're going to see how this works, how sanctions on the central bank, possibly extending the energy sector later, how does that play out into the global economy and the global financial system? And we really don't know. It's it's a completely unknown domain that uh, we're learning as we go. We seem to be in a new phase of war where Russia is uh, responding to its initial failure by expanding its bombing into civilian areas and apparently trying to surround Ukraine's major cities and cut them off. And meanwhile, the West is committing nothing short of economic war with unprecedented sanctions against Russia, while also increasing the supply of deadly weapons. So it seems like things could get a lot worse before they get better. And I just want to ask you whether you share that sentiment and that's what you're seeing. I do think it will get worse before it gets better. And I think the world is facing some dark days over this war. The first way, which is already happening, is an escalation of the violence that Russia is perpetrating on the Ukrainian people. How far that will go, we don't know. But with every day that goes by, with every artillery shell, a rocket that's fired into a populated urban area, you have a mounting humanitarian crisis that can reach fairly quickly, completely intolerable levels. Second, Russia is a complex state led by an autocrat. And the continued stability of the Russian state is not a foregone conclusion. And so while I would certainly never predict or speculate about the likelihood of something like that. If Putin loses this war, or if it drags out into a quagmire, his ability to maintain stability in his country and with his regime will be challenged and stressed, which can have cascading implications on other risks that we care about, including the control of nuclear weapons. And that's the third one that I will recognize. And while I'm certainly not going to claim that it is at all certain or even probable, that there will be a nuclear exchange or a nuclear accident as a result of this. This is one of the first time in decades that there has been an active shooting war with a nuclear armed state, with the stakes being so high. And most people today don't think about nuclear weapons very much. But 30 years ago, during the Cold War, people thought about them all the time and lived in a degree of terror at their possibility that they would be used. And unfortunately, we have to once again consider these scenarios where a nuclear weapon could be detonated in a city as a result of deliberate escalation or some form of an accident. And that is among the greatest tail risks that the international community could ever face. And it's a real possibility, although I would not go so far as to say a likelihood. Richard, thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Jim. I'm going to now turn to Karen. And Karen, on February 24th, you wrote a observations entitled, What a Shooting War Between Russia and Ukraine Could Mean for Commodity Markets. Now, we're taping this, as I mentioned before, on the late afternoon of March 1st. And already, commodity markets are gapping up. So I think it's important for you to give us the main points from this observations and your assessment 
of the critical factors going forward and how this could hit the asset markets as well as economies. Thank you, Jim. You know, our hearts are obviously um, in Ukraine. And uh, in many ways, we are focused on long-term issues like what will happen to global governance and markets from a long-term perspective. But in an immediate near-term perspective, what's happening in commodity markets is probably the single most important thing for most investors listening to this in terms of where their exposures actually lie, because commodity markets have so many knock-on effects to equity markets, to currencies, and so on and so forth. And you can have a war that goes into different situations in terms of what the commodity markets were set up like before the war started. And what you basically had is this, this war happened into a commodity market that was already very, very tight. By that, I mean very low inventories, very low supply growth, basically not enough commodities relative to demand before any of this ever happened. And what that means is that you have this environment where you're very susceptible to supply disruption, where even small changes in supply can have a big impact. And I'll give two quick historical analogies that we go through um, you know, in this wire. One is the last time that you know, Russia attacked Ukraine when it annexed Crimea in 2014, you really didn't see that much in commodity markets. Now, obviously, it's a much smaller war, but you just didn't have this structural issue in commodity markets. In comparison, when you look at the Arab Spring, you, know, you look at 2011 in Libya, the Gaddafi regime collapses. It maybe took 1% of oil offline. So this is not exactly you know, a huge amount of world oil coming offline. And you had a huge price move, you know, a 50% price move in oil you know, it was a major shock. And so it really matters the structure of commodity markets going in. So I'll just hit on a couple of commodities where Russia and Ukraine are really big. Everybody knows that Russia is you know, a major exporter of natural gas, of oil. It's also a big exporter of wheat. And Ukraine also is a big exporter of wheat and corn. So in the oil markets, you know, you're kind of going into this period where we describe more depth in here, where there has been so much underinvestment that some OPEC members can't even increase oil production to be in line with the quotas they've announced they will hit. And so that's a very, very tight market. We show you know, some of these inventory charts. These are some of the lowest inventories we've seen in many years. Very, very tight market, small disruption. I mean, this is worse than it was during the Gaddafi time I talked about. So getting a 10% move in one day, like we saw here on you know, the Tuesday that we're taping this, that makes sense to us given the structure of the market. And really, U.S. shale is the only supply that can come online quickly in this environment. And then food, you know, totally unrelated to Russia, supplies got very low just from a three-year kind of sequence of bad crop weather and so on. And you have this food ecosystem of soybeans, corn, and wheat, where they're all kind of interchangeable. You know, you can feed your animals corn or wheat. But when all three of them are low, when all three of them don't have, you know, much excess supply, then disruption in any one of them kind of hits the whole food ecosystem in a way that is very significant, especially to emerging markets where food is a big part of the spend. And last time we had such tight food markets and you got prices rallying you know, very rapidly, you got a lot of social unrest that ensued, things like the Arab Spring. Now, in the observations, you talked, as you just did now, about even a 1% type of supply disruption would be a big deal for the market. And so I'm just wondering, and we've already heard some voices to this effect, what would happen if there was a proactive decision in the West to actually boycott direct purchases of Russian products like oil, energy, agricultural products, and so on? What could we be looking at? It's a great question. And it's a question I'll say that our research team is hard at work at. And we don't know if we know the answers yet, because our you know immediate sense is that Europe will have to ration some of its economic activity. So it'll be a big growth hit. We know this because last year, there was a real supply issue of Russian gas into Europe um, that was more you know, engineered by Russia. And still, you saw factories turning off because you just didn't have enough energy and they prioritized lower income households and so on and had to use government budgets to actually pay people to make sure people had enough money to pay for heating. And so our guess is this would be a big growth hit in places like Europe, but there's a lot to figure out. How fast can you know nuclear power or coal come online? How will Europeans think about issues was like climate change in the context of this imperative to get rid of reliance on Russia, um, will they be comfortable turning on coal if that goes faster uh, versus nuclear, which they had other objections to, but is good on climate change issues? How much of Russia's oil will end up being redirected by people who are willing to buy it? 
all of these things are, you know, open research, active, but we, these are exactly the scenarios we think we have to start getting the answers to. What is pretty clear is that this is an inflationary shock that is much more likely to also be stagflationary. In other words, half impact for you, also slow growth at the same time than others that we've seen, which is, of course, very concerning. It's the last thing policymakers would want. That brings me to my last question, Karen. You know, just this week on March 2nd, you published an observation entitled Oil Shocks Compounding Existing Inflationary Dynamic, the 1970s Analogy. And, you know, in the 1970s, we had that stagflation that you just mentioned. And it was, you know, coming out of the 1960s, there was a big fiscal spend around the Great Society and the Vietnam War. And then we had the oil embargo of the early 70s, and then in the later 70s, as it pertained to the Iranian crisis. So maybe you could walk us through the major points of this in terms of whether you're seeing those similar dynamics and whether stagflation is a likely result. You know, when we talk about the 70s, and this is not the first time we've talked about the 70s in the last year as inflation has risen, we got a lot of uh, responses, which I think are right, which is there are big differences between today and the 70s. You know, there's a lot less unionization. There's a lot of part of the economy that's digital. And so very low marginal cost of production. And so there are certain factors that make a compounding rise in inflation less likely. But we still think the 70s analogy is very important for investors because it is the last time we had circumstances much like today. And when you look at those circumstances, they were very, very bad for investors for lacking inflation protection. And like you're saying, you basically had an already booming inflationary environment. You already had inflationary pressures building prior to the commodity supply shock. When the commodity supply shock hit, you had this issue where policymakers kind of fell behind on tightening because it felt exogenous, right? There's a one-off nature. There's war in the Middle East. That doesn't feel like related to our uh, situation. They didn't tighten as aggressively into that. And there was also a sense that it could hit growth, which it did. And the reason stagflation is so difficult for policymakers is they have this dual mandate that's suddenly in conflict. On one hand, you want to raise interest rates because you've had booming inflation for a while. Uh, you know, in the case of the 70s, it had been a number of years. Today, it's been, you know, since COVID. And at the same time, keeping unemployment low is the other part of your mandate. And when those two are in conflict and you don't want to raise rates to hit the economy, it's a very difficult situation. What you saw happening in the 70s, though, is that policymakers really fell radically behind and at the same time, markets lag the move even more. And this was just terrible for investors. You had a situation where you know bonds did terribly for investors, consistent losses for uh, investors, and then stocks were really not offering much of any protection from rising inflation. We think this is one of the more relevant periods um, to look at. And one of the interesting differences is that wow, today's real interest rates are falling very, very fast because inflation is rising while real rates in the market are actually falling because. Basically, the markets are pricing exactly that, that in stagflation, policymakers are not going to tighten aggressively if growth is at risk and there's a war. These are extremely, extremely low real interest rates, much lower than we saw in the 70s. And we think it'll probably take a significant tightening to keep inflation at bay in a way that could be more and more painful if you keep hitting growth. Great. Thanks so much, Karen. Thanks, Jim. Okay, Larry, I want to switch to you. I did a podcast on February 22nd with associate strategist and our colleague, Melissa Safier. And in that podcast, we talked about how diversifying stocks and bonds have been to each other over the last 20 years, particularly, and how unusual that is actually over a longer term time frame, And that we would seriously question that on a going forward basis because of the constraint of inflation. Now, in the aftermath of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, bond yields uh, in the developed world have rallied very hard. So maybe you could give us our assessment on how you view this critical issue. On, on the question of diversification, it gets down to what the drivers are of asset prices. And the diversification benefits of bonds versus stocks are less likely to persist when inflation is the driver relative to historically what growth has been a more volatile driver of assets than inflation. And so, yes, you are correct in that the last few days we've seen a classic sort of um, flight to quality in which we saw bonds and to a lesser extent bond yields fall to a lesser extent, but to some extent gold rise and equities fall. And so this is sort of like classic sort of risk off market action. But we still think the same thing applies. It is possible they diversify one another, 
but less likely in a period where inflation is the driver, is a bigger driver of asset prices than it historically has been. And inflation is generally more, in times of rising and falling inflation, the correlation of bonds and stocks is much higher than when growth is the, is the driver. And then on February 23rd, you wrote an observation. I think it's just so apropos here because of all the uncertainties that both Richard and Karen were highlighting. And it was entitled Managing Money Through Geopolitical Conflict, the Russia-Ukraine Crisis, uh, where you described how we think about political types of tail events. So maybe you could describe the most important takeaways from that observations. Well, the most important thing is that we're not trying to predict geopolitical events. And even when they occur, our edge is not going to be predicting the outcome once they've started. The starting point is to be balanced and diversified to a broad range of outcomes and understand not only the direct impacts of the geopolitical events, but the potential second and third order impacts from those events so that we can have a good idea both from that understanding as well as studying how they've played out in history and the potential cone of outcomes and range of outcomes that our returns are acceptable in a wide range of outcomes. That's the most important thing. And when we look across history, it's very difficult even once once these events begin. First of all, to hedge once these events are known is generally too expensive. And then even when they have started, it's hard to know big from little. You know, we have many historical examples where things look big and ended up relatively small impact on markets, not unimportant events. And other things look like they might be very big and end up very small and end up very big. You know, we take, for example, the Cuban Missile Crisis, which is sort of a defining moment in geopolitical events, ended up having a relatively small impact on markets, which obviously was not knowable even during the time it was occurring. And then we have other events, the events that cascaded you know, into World War I were hard to know that was going to go that way either, even if you were living through it and reading those papers at the time. And so that's why it starts from having a proper balance and diversification beforehand and stress testing your portfolio, not only for the historical cases, but the linkages of the current case. For example, the current we, we compare the current case, which is occurring during a very hot economy and inflationary time period, and has a big commodity oil aspect to it. We can compare that to some historical examples, which have similar, similar type exposures and backdrops. But again, that's a starting point, and we still want to consider different outcomes from similar situations. Well, thank you, Larry. Appreciate your time. Thanks, Jim. Well, that brings us to the conclusion of this edition of Editor's Picks and certainly a very fluid environment, which we'll continue to track. Thank you to all of our listeners. We hope you enjoyed the conversation.